But when I started fading out, so to speak, everything softened, the whole turmoil of seeking and of trying to find fulfillment, it just softened. So no, I had a I had a slow and smooth death. Very nice, very nice. Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, faded out. While I while I thought I'm on a path towards enlightenment, I just faded out. Mm. It's funny how it can just all come to a halt, and then there's life, and there's the beauty of life, and. And then you wonder what the heck it was all about. Yeah, absolutely. There's no trace left of seeking. It just yeah. wasn't there, actually, at all. Hello, I'd like to welcome uh, Andreas Moller, who is from southern Germany um, and has been sharing uh, talks on truth for over 12 years. Thank you very much for the invitation and hello. Yeah. Hello. So how would you describe um, what it is you do? Yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, why do we start with a difficult question? Um, yeah, makes the rest of the talk easier, I think. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's really hard. That's really hard to describe or say. Um, yeah, there are those talks happening, and what's shared apparently is this non dual message. Let's just put it like that. Mm -hmm. well, you're you're not too far off in age from from me, so maybe this is a bit easier for you. Uh, what is your earliest memory um, from childhood where you felt like separate? <laughs> yes, separate. Yeah, exactly. Well, to be honest, I don't know really. It must be between five or six. I my memory starts quite late, actually. Um, so right, I don't know the, the first memory, but I think around that, that's when, when it starts. And I guess that there was the sense to be someone or the illusion to be a separate me running, of course. Yeah, yeah and uh, uh, you, you had your awakening in 2009, I think you said, and... Or something like that. Was that right? Well, yeah. I I have a completely different wording, so to speak. Okay. Um, uh, for me, it's more like the when this illusion of the me dropped. That was around right. uh, 2010, 2011. Okay. And what age would that have been, roughly? Oh, uh, well, was I'm, it? I'm terrible with math. So. 31. <laughs> I would have been 31. 31. Okay. <laughs> um, and... And so from, you know, five or six, when you felt that separateness to 31, something in between, you know, the, the journey, the belief in being a separate me, how did that unfold? Like, did it become darker uh, gradually over time? Would you say the, like, what was the next, like after five or six, what was the next kind of key well, of moment or... Well, key moment. I mean, I, well, in the end, it's it seemed to have just become more solid. I think people would call this becoming an adult. So the world seemed more solid, and with everything seemed to become more real and serious. And suddenly, it seemed to be about something. And and what was it about for you? What was the about? Would you say what was the the storyline that made it seem serious? Well, I don't know. Just the issues in my family. Or I don't know, really. It's just, I think it, it was coming from all sides, you know, in school. And you're just treated more like an adult the older you grow. And I think it's 
Yeah, and on the other hand, I think the sense of separation also, well, it's all in the story. Apparently, it solidifies itself. Mm -hmm. I think in childhood, it has something very innocent, probably mm -hmm. still coming and going and mm -hmm. not as solid as it seems to become afterwards or later on. Right. Well, I was actually quite childlike until... 12 or 13 or 14 regarding um, playing with, I built Lego stuff. I don't know. In Germany, Lego is quite big. Right. So I, had a, I had a very quick change from playing with Lego to becoming a serious a person and alcohol drinking uh, youngster. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say that you had uh some uh a fairly stable upbringing were your parents you know did they were they there for you did they give you attention and whatnot well, something or? in between of course in the story it's kind of never enough but right. uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> could have been uh, yeah. much worse so it was all right it was Cle clearly it wasn't too bad if they uh they let you keep playing with lego you know for a little while there but yeah. Well, I don't know if they liked it actually. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Um yeah, so so you throughout high school, did you did you would you say that you always kind of were a fairly aware, self-aware kid? Um No, I wouldn't say so. I mean, I was really I was a rather normal kid. Uh, I mean, I was No, I like playing, playing all kinds of things. So yeah. it also included uh, playing army and uh, being yeah. police and right, what, yeah. what kids do. I think I was just, just I like playing. Okay, yeah. Um, There's and... really nothing, nothing about, I never questioned the meaning of life or stuff like that. I know people who started questioning the meaning of life when they were six or seven. Right, I, yeah. I never had that. I was just... <laughs> That was too boring. <laughs> I don't know. It just, just didn't interest me, really. So eventually, because uh, you had mentioned in 2009 or 2010, you had run into uh, Tony Parsons, I think. Yeah. And uh, the the path that you took uh, from, let's say, like you said you were 31, so high school's done at what? 19 years old or something something like that yeah yeah so what, what did you do after high school um well in the first years well i went a bit into a i had a bit of a, a phase where i where i took uh, substances i i had uh yeah that was in the last years of high schools and it took over two or three years after high school mm -hmm. so but that already was kind of seeking that's when the interest in happiness and what is happiness and what makes you happy mm. when it's popped up in my life so to speak so the substances kind of helped uh, initiate the search yeah i guess so i guess they initiated the search yeah yeah because suddenly there were there were those very impressive experiences that I haven't known before, and I was shocked by them mm -hmm. and and fascinated. So, yeah, and then this become my my method, so to speak, my my path to just try and play with those substances. But it was actually the first time when I thought that I'm on a path towards something greater which mm. turned out to be a complete dream in the end. But I think we'll talk about that still. Yeah, we'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> so the the substance uh, stuff, did that hit a negative point eventually where it felt like um, it, it was, you know, the the effects on the body were too much or... Yeah, it was, it was both. I mean, it didn't affect me too strongly to be honest i i came out very well um compared to what could have happened so i was basically fine but yeah it was just too much or there was just a time where this 
phase was over and it has a lot of aspects. It was too much. I was tired and it didn't work anymore. For It was almost overnight. The fascination was gone. Mm. I could still feel the effects, but it was completely without fascination anymore, as if it became empty, Mm. the effects and all the stuff. So it was over. It was clear it was over. Like watching a a movie for the hundredth time and... A bit like that, exactly, yeah. a bit like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And and then what? What? what uh, you, you just dropped it like a, you know? No, like a... well, it, it, it took a while. It took a few months to break the habit. The, mm-hmm. It was kind of the, the drive was gone, but it took a while to break the habit, a few months, basically. Mm-hmm. And what what replaced it was spirituality. Okay, so what? Uh, how did that come about exactly? Well, of course, first um, in the first few years, I did a, a bit of healing stuff, breathing stuff. I needed to learn to be sober again and to live sober, coming out of this party mode <laughs> again, yeah. facing the seriousness of the world. Yeah. So, to speak. so there was a bit of healing going on for a few years. And then I went into the spirituality, this awareness stuff, and so. How did uh, what was the introduction to that? Was there was it uh, a book in particular? Or? Uh, no, I was. Uh, I met someone who gave uh, satsang. Okay. So that's. And who was the someone? If you don't mind me asking. Well, back then he was called Samapan. Okay. Uh, I, right. I yeah, I'd have to Google it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and and how did that experience uh, impact you? Just uh, was it kind of a, I don't know, a light bulb moment or? Well. Well, I was someone. I felt like I was someone, and I and to me it felt like as if I found the answer at that time. At that time, I felt very well taken care of, and yeah, yeah. It's hard to say because, of course, looking back, I have another. I see it in a different light. But <clears throat> at yeah. that time, it was impressive again, to be honest. It mm-hmm. was quite similar to when I started partying, kind of. Mm. A new entertainment, yeah. <laughs> a bit like that, yeah. As I said, for me, the partying was a bit more than entertainment. Mm. There, there was a, a, quite an, an interest in this dynamic, as I said, mm-hmm. happiness, what is happiness and stuff. Right. And this just continued in this setup, in this surrounding. Mm. So was the uh, the happiness the question of what is happiness was that gradually turning into um what is peace or you know the your definition of happiness I'm guessing was was changing over time too oh, all the time of course yeah. I think every few months I thought something else what true happiness would look like sometimes I thought it it must be bliss sometimes i thought it must be some silent contentment or yeah mm. of course yeah yeah Just depending on what i thought i understood at that time right right and uh and so that went on for the rest of your 20s i guess or yeah one could say so yeah okay exactly yeah um and and so eventually how did you come across uh what was it tony parsons yeah it was actually also quite a surprise because it was at a time where i wasn't looking for someone Mm. the spiritual game was already crumbling i had an i had a moment without there being someone apparently and so i couldn't keep up this this yeah, this personal game of seeking and this dance around being aware and being conscious and be on a path and be more conscious. So, so you had, uh, I guess, what people call a satori. 
Is that right? I guess or, maybe that's yeah. yeah yeah exactly. I call this a glimpse or uh, no a, a glimpse of of no mind and yeah of no one a glimpse of, of no, no awareness actually not only no mind but also yeah. and just there's the just void no yeah and that's when this whole seeking dynamic really got it was like a slap in my face actually because I felt like a. I was the incarnated seeker, so to speak. I mean, every me is that, but yeah, yeah. I was, I was a seeker. That's how I, I identified myself. Mm -hmm. So then, suddenly, there was no one there for an apparent moment, and that was really a shock, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then you, then the me came back and looked around, and I was like. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. But it, I felt quite good at that time because, of course, I, um, I came back, but I was left with a wow. That was okay. I wasn't the kind of depressed or something afterwards. No, it mm. was quite cool because a, a heavy uh, it felt like as if a heavy burden had lifted off so mm -hmm. the seeking just became less and that was the burden that dropped i was still someone but i felt much much lighter afterwards right and in that time i met tony it just popped up on my internet actually as i said i was so happy i felt so free at that time i was really happy to be on my own and to not follow someone or to net to not have someone where where i thought i need to go to right right yeah Tell that's usually that. usually when someone appears yeah when you don't need them anymore <laughs> yeah and then tony popped up and yeah there was an interest here a curiosity and an interest Oh well, what is what's that about? Mm. Mm. And and was I can't recall. Is he based in Germany too, or is he? No, he's in the UK. Oh, okay. Well, he was coming to Germany a few times a year. Oh, okay, okay. So you hopped on a train and at some point. Yeah, kind yeah. of. It was quite. <laughs> I mean, the moment I discovered him, I also discovered that he's in Munich. was uh, was two hours away, um, three weeks later, and um, so yeah, I went. Mm. Maybe for a short moment, not trying to go because I felt so lovely and free. Right. Going didn't somewhere. didn't want someone to mess it up or. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so how would you describe the experience when you went there? Uh, was it a typical guru disciple atmosphere there or, or, you know, is it where you have all the doting followers, uh, in front of the, the well, teacher? Well, not at, kind all. Of thing? Not not at, at all. all. I found it so different from what I was used to. And I was a bit irritated in the beginning because it all looked very different, very unspiritual very ordinary very ordinary absolutely there was no guru thing going on and then the meeting started and then i heard those sentences where i thought i'd heard them before but i couldn't get them together it sounded to me as if i'm hearing them for the first time you know stuff like there's no separation and there is no one i've kind of heard this in spirituality already but looking back it was rather an idea or conceptual so i heard those words that i thought i heard before already and that i somehow understood and stuff like that but it felt like very fresh mm, okay and uh did you feel something shift there during the the first meeting or the you said that uh that was um that was the point where you say it's not an awakening, but, you know, the realization of no self or was there? Oh, no, I was still someone for a while. I, okay. It, it didn't happen at that meeting. Oh, okay. So I still was someone for a while. So 
I think nothing special happened in that meeting. There was just this mix left of fascination and irritation that there was somehow something familiar going on, but also something ungraspable, something where I felt separate from. Uh, so would you say it was kind of highlighting um, those last remaining threads of of attachment to me, meanness? Was that the irritation? Well, yeah, the irritation was that I thought that I achieved something. Mm. You know, I, I thought that I achieved something in all my path. Though this awakening that I had, I didn't do it, but it still felt as if it happened to me. And as right. if and as if it turned me into someone who's ahead or advanced. Right. So at that point you you were in an an enlightened ego. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, one could say so, absolutely. And the surprise was that I couldn't land at all anywhere in those meetings. And of course I thought I, I thought I, I should be able to land somewhere. So that was the irritation about yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then that went on for a while, I guess, or how many meetings would you say that you, you took part in? Oh, boy, that's hard to say. It's not that much, actually. A few, I don't know. I think it went on for a, for a year then or one and a half years that I went there every few months, maybe. Not in the first time because I was traveling no, so not in the first half year after the first meeting, but then over winter time, I think every two or three months. And each time you went, would you say something uh, shifted or something was yeah. seen? No, no, okay. not not in terms of like this. Then I saw this. Then I saw this. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It was just it, it became more and more timeless. Everything and less and less understanding and less irritation yeah yeah one could say so less irritation everything stayed the same but there was less and less irritation yeah mm -hmm. about this message and in general yeah that's a good way to describe it and i'm assuming there was at uh, some point where uh you suddenly felt no irritation <laughs> Exactly, yes. That was a surprise because I didn't have an event. I didn't have an event of the dropping of the me or uh, it just wasn't there anymore. And at some point there was an apparent, it's very important, It's an, it was apparent, an apparent noticing that, oh, wow, there's no, no seeking. Just around right. anymore it was almost like i had to admit it out of a habit i would have loved to say i was yeah of course i'm still seeking i'm still a me but mm. that, that just wasn't there anymore mm. yeah yeah so that's why i like the word dissolution you know something dissolving and uh, like a sugar cube in hot tea you know absolutely and 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 here it, it happened rather unnoticed. That's what I mean. The moment of the, the sugar, when you put the sugar in the tea, the, the dissolution, it lasted for about two years. It took two years. So I didn't notice it. I wasn't aware of it. I didn't notice it. So how did, uh, how did things progress? Um... Well, actually, the talks, they, they started out of this death, coming out of this death. But it's it's very funny because I, I didn't plan it to happen. And in a way, it felt also weird to do it because I didn't have to say anything. So I, I didn't felt like I have to share anything or I have to share this because there was nothing left anymore which knows anything or which has a concept or lives in a knowledge. There was just no one there. And but miraculously, those meetings were set up, and they happened. 
Yeah, and and what was that initial introduction to quote unquote sharing or teaching uh, for you? What was that like? Well, what do you mean? Well, sitting with, uh, sitting there, being with others in a space of non-teaching. Well, well, yeah, it was mostly, what do you want from me? I know I invited you, but I have no idea (laughs) why, and I can't give you anything, and my uh, yeah, actually uh, at first i always wanted to say hey, well don't ask me you can just see tony <laughs> <laughs> it's really uh, no it interest was, it was a referral system yeah almost but then these words didn't come out mm. so what was coming out was my words or were those words were coming out and uh, yeah was surprising for me as well but yeah and that was 2000 just after 2010 i guess yeah exactly yeah 2000 yeah and uh did you start writing shortly after that or well people were not actually not uh, no no it took a while actually but people were asking and so yeah do you Mm. write something and Mm -hmm. then yeah well, writing, I mean, most books are from the talks, so I hardly sit down and write stuff. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I do, but not too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so how would you now describe, I think I asked you this at the beginning, but we'll uh, circle back to it. How would you, if someone were to walk up to you, you know, and say, hey, uh, Andreas, what the hell is it that you do? Because I've had that asked me before, and uh, and it's usually by someone who, you know, isn't into this type of thing, you know, yeah. uh, and, and I have no idea what to say. So do you, have you uh, put together like a little note that you pull out of your wallet and you tell people? Or... <laughs> well, not really, but in the end, it, I, I notice it becomes more and more, direct even talking to to those people i just tell them that i give seminars which Mm. is still kind of acceptable and then they ask what it's about and then i say well it's about that there is no me there is no one and then usually it's either okay or they're curious and want to know more but that hardly happens actually yeah usually they turn around and start running or it's not that bad. Not, not that bad. Okay. <laughs> um. So, given the the current play on the planet, uh, you know, with all of the um, new new brand of insanity, with you know the the lockdowns and the uh, the wars and everything, uh, how do you feel what you share with with people uh, plays into that? at all if at all yeah that's a good question i don't i don't think there's a there's a real connection to all of that Mm -hmm. i don't i don't have an opinion really on what's going on or on this stuff Mm -hmm. Um, so uh yeah i guess uh i'll play the role of the the person who crosses uh your path and says you know, I, I'm uh, because it does feel on the planet like there's a growing sense of disconnection and isolation, and and at the same time, the opposite of that in, in smaller quantities, maybe. Uh, but let's say someone who's feeling that disconnection and 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 uh, you know, feeling very uh lonely not alone but lonely uh, mm. um comes up to you and you know and says well how if i go to one of these seminars you're talking about no me how does that why would that be uh how would that help me out well that's hard to say because of course I, I would say it wouldn't help you out there is no way out there's just what seems to be happening my impression is there's just 
a, a, a very small group of people who are really interested in, in this message or in this. And of course, one could say it's um, it's when the sense to be a me, the sense to be a self, becomes un, un, unpleasant. This whole sense to be someone itself, when this seems to become a burden, then there may be an openness to this message. And that's the people who usually come to these meetings. And of course, on the surface, they seek for help and they seek for a way out. But apparently there's an openness to hear something completely different, namely that the one who seeks for a way out isn't real. So it's a very different meeting than what's usually on offer. It's not mm -hmm. better or stuff, but it's very different from what's usually on offer. And it's really about something else. Then yeah, it, it's not about offering a, a solution. It's about showing that no solutions are needed. Yes, exactly. More? It doesn't try to satisfy the seeker's need. Right. Um, now, I don't know if that helps the world or not, but it's kind of the collapse of all those, yes, yeah. artificial needs and the attempt to fulfill those needs. Do you find that people that come to sit with you um, have one idea in mind about why they're there and then eventually find out there's a whole other reason they're there? <laughs> well, they find out, <laughs> well, it becomes quite obvious that there is no reason uh, to be at the meetings. And in the end, it even turns out that there is no one, no me sitting at the meetings. But of course... And as that is the there is someone they have an idea about what life is about and stuff. Yeah, so you could say the the paradox or, um, you know, the there is a reasonless reason for them being there to arrive at not having a reason, I suppose, or letting go of their reasons. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just a turning out that they send themselves sound real or the sense to be someone isn't real. And that's the only thing that believes in, I'm here for a reason. This has to be about something. Why am I here on earth? <laughs> Why am I me? What's this right. about? And then they invent this ideas about it's about fulfillment. It's about enlightenment. It's, about, it's not about anything. And I think energetically, this can become quite well obvious, whatever. Yeah. Uh, do you share mostly through silence, or do you still? Uh, is it is it a full on talk usually when people sit with you? Well, I wouldn't call it sharing. Of course, it's whatever words come up. Mm -hmm. It's it's really an 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 a replying. It's an answering. It's 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 an it's a reply to the seeking energy. It's nothing replying to the seeking energy, and uh, this reply, which is actually a non-reply, is energetic. Usually, there there's a lot of conversations going on, but the, this answer is happening when there are words, but also when there are no words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's not a sharing in terms of I have something that I can share with people. It's really this no space return. being a space for their seeking to burn up in. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a trash <laughs> <laughs> trash can, uh, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> they can, can just fall into it. Yeah, maybe if it does. Usually it doesn't. And then, what would you say? Uh, what would you say is the most common reason for people's resistance to what you answer in these meetings? Well, I think it's not a conscious resistance, but the me, the the impression to be a me, is the resistance. Because the me wants to be and live, and all it's seeking is about being and not want to die. Right. Yeah. So it, can't, it really does come to the, the 
the worst place it could ever come to. <laughs> so to speak, yes. It's for nothingness, which is all there is anyway. Suddenly shouts back, I'm nothing. Yeah. I am nothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, just sorry, one sentence. I mean, all of this is really impersonal. All of that just happens by itself. The resistance, the whatever, the openness. So yeah. So now, uh, how how uh, how are things in your life when you relate with your family, and because that's always a colorful dynamic uh, afterwards. Well, quite normal, I'd say. Um, I, I'm still seeing everyone. What's that? I'm still seeing every visiting everyone. Yeah. And, still go yeah. down for Christmas and. Yeah, stuff yeah. like that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. And well, that's good. It sounds like you've uh, you've not had too many uh, tumultuous um, events that uh, that tend to pop up during this whole process, or or has there been one or two? Well, that was basically when I was in spirituality. I mean, of course, when I when I was taking substances and spirituality, that was a bit uh, an intense phase. But when I started fading out, so to speak, everything softened. The whole turmoil of seeking and of trying to find fulfillment it just softened. So no, I had a. I had a slow and smooth death. Very nice. Very nice. (laughs) 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 Uh, Just faded out. While I while I thought I'm on a path towards enlightenment, I just faded out. Mm. It's funny how it can just all come to a halt and then there's life and there's the beauty of life and and then you wonder what the heck it was all about yeah absolutely there's no trace left of seeking it just wasn't there actually at all it was never real there never was a real seeker Mm -hmm. sure seemed real for a while yeah that's true yeah Yeah, and i suppose that's that's where the compassion comes in as uh although it's a dream and it's unreal it it uh, it's it's a pretty crappy experience when it seems real. <laughs> yeah, apparently there are people suffer from it. Kind yeah, of. yeah. So, do you get caught up sometimes with the words like apparently and and stuff like that? Like, uh, do people uh, sometimes say that it's uh, like spiritual bypassing of the human experience, or oh yeah. I know, yeah, What's yeah, that? Yeah. yeah, you get into that. <laughs> yeah. It's hard hard to navigate um this type of thing to to talk about it and use language that's fundamentally dualistic and and uh yeah. Well, I mean, I don't talk very much about this outside of the meetings, or I would say this message only comes up actually when there is an openness to it. So I don't have much problems with it in daily life. And in the meetings, there's an openness to this anyway. But right, those, yeah. those accusations, you can read them sometimes on the, as comments on YouTube clips and stuff. So <laughs> yeah. but I'm not too often approached with it directly yeah yeah oh people just think it's a philosophy people think that it's my answer to life that it's a personal thing and that that's my philosophy yeah because there are a lot of um you know i don't know if you call them neo advaita or neo non-dual type people out there that you know are all about words you know and and it's it's not actually coming from experience and um so when you have to use the same words that you know those people use those people but um yeah then, the good thing then, is I'm, I'm hardly i'm hardly watching anyone i don't follow the scene so to speak yeah 
So yeah, if I come across that, I usually have to take a break for like six months before I can digest anymore. It's usually, <laughs> usually pretty heavy uh, and not very enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, can. Well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you for uh, the the chat. And uh, is there anything else you wanted to share before we? I was going to plug your website there. Oh, yeah. All right. Well. No, there's no thing. I'm fine. Uh, yeah, so you have uh, a website, thetimelesswonder.com, right? Not, yep. Not D-E or anything like that? No. Nope. Yeah, because you're dot .com. And yeah, I have your books up here on Amazon. No Thing, mm -hmm. Ungraspable Freedom, and You Will Never Be Free. Isn't that yeah. a doozy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> May not reach the New York Times bestseller, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. uh, I'm sure it's written. It's well enough written, I'm sure, to uh, to be on there. But given the status quo, anyway. Yeah, yeah. that's what people want to hear. <laughs> they want to hear you can make it. You'll be free. Uh, yeah, there is it'll, someone. it'll work out in the end. Yeah. You'll be enlightened <laughs> soon. That's what people want to hear. Yeah. Uh, all right uh thank you andreas for meeting and um yeah I'll, I'll keep an eye on you and maybe we can hang out again at some point cool thank you very much thanks yeah. for the invitation yeah it's good thanks. being with you yeah all right lovely thank you uh, yeah i'll talk to you later yeah bye bye